Welcome to the Leadership Experience Podcast, where we seek to build connections, talk relevant issues about warfighting and share professional knowledge through experience and lessons learned with guests from a variety of different professional backgrounds. It's our way to relate to multiple generations within our formation and create real conversations as we build a team of teams committed to winning and dedicated to the pursuit of excellence. We hope you enjoy our content. You can continue to find the Lancer Brigade on Facebook and Instagram and find our podcast content on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as you search for the Lancer Brigade or the Leadership Experience. Enjoy. Hey team, check it out. Today we welcome Colonel Retired Greg Gatson. On May 7, 2007, Colonel Gatson's life was forever changed when a roadside bomb caused him to lose both of his legs. Though having sustained such serious injuries, Colonel Gadsden persevered to become a motivational speaker, avid photographer, and actor. In his most recent venture, Diversity Pop, Colonel Gadsden is working to develop inclusive diversity training focused around the way we work. His contributions today will cover both his personal and professional stories, both in and out of uniform. Hey, sir, uh, Colonel uh, Retire Greg Gadsden, and I really appreciate you taking the time and sitting down and having a conversation with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. Nice again. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation, and and uh, you know, as you know, we just you know within five minutes of just chatting, um, we just got you know so many paths that you know nine years apart, we still we still cross some uh, cross some dirt, some soil together. Yes, sir. You know, for for the team that that uh, is going to get a chance to hear your story and all the things you're doing, you know, we're on the heels of Veterans Day which, you know, I know is, is very important for us and for you, and we thank you for your service. And now coming into Thanksgiving, especially during this challenging time of 2020, you know, what message would you leave with our team about what you're personally thankful for and then the perspective, both serving and now as a, uh, as a vet, that you're thankful for? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, I, I'm just uh, – I'm super, super grateful um, – to have served, um, I, you know, sometimes people ask me what would I change, and and uh, and I say I wouldn't change a thing. And I say that not that I did everything uh, perfect or I did everything well, because I, I I certainly have had my share of uh, mistakes. It's because that that's the journey. That's what creates us. That's what makes us. And. You know, if you like where you are or you don't like where you are, you always have a chance to uh, kind of change that. But it's a, it's a, we, we just can't pick and choose in life what, um, you know, what makes us us. You know, we, is the scars as long as, as well as the victories is, is what makes us complete. And so, um, and so I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, 2020, like I say, like life marks in time. Life doesn't care what is 2020. It's our calendar and, and life is always changing. Uh, sometimes, most of the time, we probably don't notice. But um, this pandemic and, and a lot of the challenges that perhaps we see around the world in our country are, are probably accented um, a little bit more than usual. And so we, we, we seem to have tied it to 2020. Um, um, but again, change is inevitable. And I, I think, um, I think kind of, you know, lived the uh, 25 years, 26 years in the army and seen the change from, from, you know, from the subtleties of uniforms to, to the, the difference in uh, the, the different deployments. Um, um, has given me perspective and I'm grateful for that perspective. Um, as you know, as we go through 2020, you know, uh, we are just talking about, you know, uh, Salerno and, and I, 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 that's my example of social distancing. I'm like, Hey, you want to be social distance, go live there in a freaking Afghan pack border for a year. That'll, that'll give you perspective. And again, I don't, I don't throw that in anybody's face to say I've been there, done that. But again, it, it allows me a, a valuable lesson to kind of apply and approach all of this, uh, you know, this, this 2020 with a, with a different lens. Well, sir, I, I think that the, those two points 
I think they, you know, even though we have almost a decade between our service, I, I would, I would absolutely, you know, continue to pile on that same thing. Number one, I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve. And I know we're going to get a chance to talk. I've heard you in, in a couple of things, interviews, and even in, in, in statements that uh, those have interviewed you have, you've talked about football as family. And, and, and I love to see, you know, the discussion about as you're going through life and the perspective you have. So one, you know, I know that as we walk through your journey, you're going to share about a lot of individuals, just not on the, on the football field or those that, you know, have been impactful in your life from West Point, but it's still, you're still being that teammate and, you know, almost this perspective, you start to realize as I started to do some research on you, you're just a great teammate and you're realizing life is a team sport. And so the perspective that you have, some of the guests that we've talked to in the past, like Ray Dalio and his book on principles, and, you know, those who want to, you know, work really, really hard toward an achievement, it, it takes a certain perspective to realize it's, out, it's actually about, you know, those and the network you build along this path and this journey of life. And that's going to be, you know, what you end up realizing and reward and having the appreciation. Because those that have served, you know, there's this special, this special bond that you have. And, and you don't really have, as you're saying, sir, that perspective until you end up walking away and realizing how special you were part of being, wet, you know, less than 1% protecting the 99. Absolutely. So, um, where, where would, so where, I guess, where do you want me to kind of pick up or, 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 well, look, I, I got a place, I got a good place. So, now, and I, and I want to, I love your dialogue. Um, so, um, football kind of being uh, the cornerstone. I don't want to say the cornerstone. You know, my my upbringing, uh, my parents, um, you know, I got to say, look, my parents, you know, uh, born and raised in South Carolina, born and raised in the Jim Crow South. Um, you know, those are the experiences, you know, my parents for for a generation that lived through Jim, Jim Crow and were exposed to that and, and uh, would eventually go on to Howard University, ironically established by a, a West Point grad, uh, General Oliver Otis Howard, who I, I say ironically was also an amputee from the Civil War, lost uh, an arm above the elbow. And so the fact that I, I, I find... Uh, uh, great irony, maybe great comfort that I would end up going to West Point and my parents were, were Howard University graduates. Um, but the notion of football, you know, um, early on for me, it was just the camaraderie of brothers. You know, could I, could I imagine being part of something bigger than me? Did I, could I describe it that way in those early years? Um, uh, certainly not. You know, it was almost like being a and a, being a platoon leader is something that you, you just don't have the, um, you don't have the life experiences to really truly understand and appreciate what you're part of. Um, but Coach Young, who probably just departed before you got there, maybe a year or two, um, he, 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 I believe, and what I grabbed a hold of in establishing his program, um, about team was first is about pride and and when I talk about pride we all know what pride is we understand that we're proud to be uh, uh, US soldiers and and uh, and proud to be our community but but pride first uh, how do you live that pride and how did that become how does that resonate and become part of your character and it's really about self accountability in my opinion you know what are the standards that we live up to every day? And are we willing to hold ourselves accountable? And I used to preach, I used to, I used to say, look, you know, you know, I was death on our leaders, but look, we cannot hold our soldiers accountable until we're willing to hold ourselves accountable. And, um, and, um, and that, and so that's the basis of, of building this, this team and then poise you know, we all, you know, dream of, of handling those, those pressure situations, whether it's in combat or whether it's on the ball field of, you know, just, you know, grace under fire, if you will. But poised is really about, I, what I just say is about our character. 
you know, you, you know, now, uh, having been around the block, you, you, you can't become a different person. You are who you are and that's your character. That's what grounds you. And you, you got to work on that every day and, and you start with your pride, but you know, you know, I say individually, you know, understanding the standards and living up to those things, practicing. I mean, the, the, um, I, and you and I can talk about the, the, uh, the, the given bad news as a lieutenant versus as a colonel. I mean, we don't even think twice about it now. You don't think twice about it now, but you, it, it took a lot of courage, and you got to practice that and, 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 and living up to those standards. And that's what poise is about, but it's about your character. And then team, really kind of living team. Um, uh, together, everyone achieves more. Treating everybody with dignity and respect, not marginalizing people. You know, I, I didn't leave room. I, I, I used to think of, of my soldiers as, as young men and women that all raised their hand. I used to feel it was my responsibility to get for them to for them to max help them maximize their value. And so, you know, there's no room for marginalizing people or or or, or leaving them as outcasts. It's our responsibility to, to make them part of the team. And, um, um, you know, it's whether you're on the scout team or whether you're a starter, there's nobody that's more important. And, and how do you truly live that? Um, you can sit here and say that in words, but do, uh, is your organization, do you live that in practice? And, and um, you know, I, I, I hope that I left very little daylight for, for us uh, treating people that way. And so, um, you know, I say a long story short, I couldn't ever imagine. Um, but, um, you know, I, I have to talk about uh, men like, uh, you know, Private Brown, who would ultimately be the, the young PFC that would save my life. Well, this young man, um, before we deployed for the surge in January 07, was actually uh, the NBC specialist in my unit. And, um, and my medic uh, broke his ankle and he couldn't deploy with us in meetings. So we asked for, a, we asked for a, a, a replacement medic and the Army didn't have one. My headquarters first sergeant uh, suggested sending Private Brown to a two-week EMT course at, at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, right outside of Fort Riley. He would finish just days before we were deployed and uh, and they wanted to put him in one of my subordinate platoons and bring up a, a you know a, a, a school trained medic as my uh, as my medic. I said no. Again, uh, on a couple of bases. First of all, I didn't want to disrupt any of the teamwork that we had you know that anybody had done prior to the appointment. But I think you know more personally, um, um, if this man was good enough for my soldiers, then then he was good enough for me. And so I kept him. And, uh, and, and um, he really, the doctors credit him for saving my life. I went through 129 pints of blood that night, just in that first four to six hours. I think I died five or six times. And, and uh, you know, I'm here talking to you today. And so um, did, did, did I ever imagine being a being wounded, being wounded like that, and that this young man would have my no, I didn't. But you know, you just get used to. I mean, trying to do the right thing. I can't. I'm not going to sit here and say I didn't make any mistakes. But but that is that's that was the right thing to do. Um, and and um, I, again, I'm here um, because of that. Hey, sir, I love how you open this up. So, you know, for the team that's uh, going to be listening to our conversation, you really opened up with how you talk about establishing a winning culture. As you mentioned, pride, poise, and the team. And that should parallel, you know, nicely with a lot of the things that we message with our team here, right? We say here in the Lance Brigade, we're a team of teams, you know, committed to winning, dedicated to the pursuit of excellence. And we talk about how you have to create the environment, and this environment has to have trust. As you mentioned, sir, personal accountability and discipline. It's got to be safe and secure, and it's how we communicate, how we message to the team. 
And then if you look at all the approaches that we're looking at, you know, we look at lethality, we look at how we integrate, and that's all got to be nested. And it goes down through all these different pieces of this. And the thing that I love just in that one example is, hey, I'm invested in this one soldier. I'm not just sending him to school so we can say this is good. I'm invested in him, and then he's going to be right with me. And so you, your faith, trust, I'm and trusting him. I put exactly my right, confidence. So. You know what confidence would I show if I pulled another guy and gave? I'm like that'd be jacked up, wouldn't it? Just horrible. Yes, sir. So, I mean, that's that's exactly that's exactly the the point that resonates is. If you're comfortable sending somebody for the training and then having the confidence that he can apply that in the right conditions, you know, it's got to take something. But I was wondering if we could just go back just a little bit, you know, incredibly impressive. You know, mom and dad have grown up, as you've mentioned, you know, in a time where they got to see some things um, in, in a very challenging part of our history, you know, and they're raising you. And, you know, impressive. They both are college graduates, as I understand. One's a teacher. So giving back, and then one's a pharmacist, and then they they're raising you, and you know you kind of tie this 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 uh, unique unique tie to uh, to Howard University and and West Point. You, they encourage you to play football at some point, but what is it before we go to what you're kind of like you're this mantra and what you're living now about establishing this winning culture? It starts really at the home and the value set that they've in, in, in placed and instilled in you. So I was wondering if you could share with the team, because a lot of people, as we look at leaders that we aspire to be, that serve as great examples, hear your messaging. What are some examples that mom and dad had instilled in you in the very beginning, sir? Well, um, uh, I'm, great question, and thank you. So first of all, I, I mean, I, I would I, I speak about my parents um, with great pride. God rest both their souls. They've since uh, they've they've passed um, pretty young, in fact. But um, uh, for, I, I just say first of all about hard work. I mean, um, you know, my dad picked cotton, you know, and and so just sort of understanding those stories of 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 what they did to provide for me really motivated me to, um, to re really try to create my own path. And what was funny was, you know, my parents were like number one and two in their high school. My mom was one and they were two. And I, let's say I was in at best probably in the middle of the pack in my high school. And I was just, I was just, obstructionist, at least ac academically. But I, but I also knew that um, uh, school was going to be an, an important part of my life. And I just wanted to do it my way. And so it's funny, they didn't, I don't think they really truly understood and appreciated my, my the athletic part of me. It was, it wasn't something that they could do or could afford. And so it really was not uh, part of their culture, the, um, the support athlete, uh, the su the support athletics, or even really understand them, and so I, I I was probably a bit of an outlier, but I was, but I was absolutely determined that I was going to earn a scholarship, and 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 get my way through college. I was an all state uh, football player in Virginia, but guess what? The uh, no scholarship offers, or I had one at the University of Virginia, and then they decided to, to pull it back. And so I had taken four or five official visits, and my fifth one was to West Point. I asked them if they played Division One football. They said, yeah, and I said, I'm in. I, I didn't even know what this place was, much less uh, uh, had any designs of a military career or anything. But I, I just wanted to do it on my own, and this was my opportunity. That's a great story, sir. You know, it, it's interesting when you hear people, and, and and I always ask the question, you know, those that have served, are you a trailblazer or are you a legacy? And so, you know, you're you're going your own way. So you're telling, the, you know, you're sharing your story. So, you know, mom and dad, dad, I mean, literally married up. You know, there's, I mean, you know, being one and two. So I appreciate you sharing that. You know, the value of education, but really hard work. 
And that's something that, you know, a lot of times we want to do better. And, you know, we want to mentor not so, you know, like, for example, my 16-year-old son can be me, but he can be better than me. And I want him to have his own opportunities and his own challenges. But I guarantee you, even though they may not have, you know, had the, the inclination of the importance of how much sports were, I guarantee you the same values and then the determination and work ethic that they had applied in just giving you opportunities, you were using that and using the vehicle of football to do that. Well, by the way, I, um, I had a um, – my brother and I delivered 300 newspapers every morning. So we were at a morning paper route. And I used to work at a lumber yard on the weekend. So I was, so yeah, so there was, you know, there wasn't any allowance. I was just, I was hustling and grinding and, and, uh, you know, I got through West Point on time, you know, the top 10% of the bottom 90% of my class. And, and, um, I, I just have always kind of been, uh, been a grinder. Um, but that's okay. You know what I am, I, you know, I am freaking tickled to the 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 tickled to death every day that you know that I that was how I got to where I get you know um, this this kind of grinding and understanding that you don't do anything by yourself. You you know, sir, that's interesting because you know Angela Duckworth wrote this book called Grit, and she did this study you know about cadets that were going or high school students that were going into West Point, and a lot of them, you know, are incredibly talented. You know, they have the academics, they have the talent to play Division One sports, and she was trying to figure out why they were ended up, you know, were leaving after 30 to 60, 90 days. And she was determining, you know, this thing called grit, and, they, and she breaks it up into four stages. You know, not having the interest, understanding purpose, the focus and reps, and then really this mindset growth, which I don't think, you know, other guests that we've had on before have shared something very similar like you, sir. It's like, you know, I was just told to go and do this, you know, and and I was having to do this hard work. And next thing I know is, you know, my dad's getting on me because I'm not, I didn't, I left dirt on this shovel, you know, and I'm back out there cleaning it again. And, and those little lessons about, you know, the focus to detail, having pride, as you mentioned, sir, in your opening thing, you know, um, about what you're doing and the task at hand, his av- uh, uh, um, absolutely made an impact, which led you, you know, to get to that point at West Point. And so now, now that you're there, I thought it was interesting, you know, if you could share with the team what you thought your major or what you pursued your major in. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, believe it. I thought I would, um, I thought I wanted to be an electrical engineer. Well, you know, good gosh. And I ended up being a uh, history, Middle Eastern history. So I was not, I not only went out of the hard sciences, but I, I went to the humanities. So, um, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, prophetic or not, you know, I focused on Middle Eastern history. I took two years of, uh, of Arabic and, uh, that's what I spent the next, uh, you know, 20 plus years in and out of, uh, uh, I say, um, if not Muslim, even Bosnia was a Muslim Christian conflict. So really the nature of, um, of our conflict is, has been uh, West against East, if you want to view it in those terms. So, so, sir, you know, and for the team, just to understand, as you get commissioned out of West Point, we're talking post-Cold War, Cold War era, you know, coming out. And then, but you've also had the opportunity, as, as guys understand, if you could share what you had experiences and where you deployed immediately after getting commissioned and through your time. Right. So, actually, I was commissioned at the tail end of the uh, Cold War. So, the Cold War was still like, I mean, uh, you know, class of 89, all the, I mean, our, my classmates were all going to Europe, you know, I'm like, and I, I honestly, I remember saying, I don't think we're going to fight in Europe. It doesn't seem like there's a, ever going to be a winner. I said, I thought it was going to involve Israel, but I just thought that uh, we would be fighting in the Middle East. And, and in fact, I wanted to go to 24th ID, but it uh, I wasn't going to get it because I wasn't high enough in the class at Fort Stewart. So I picked Fort Sill because um, an instructor I had had uh, um, said that there were some units at Fort Sill that had a war trace to support 
the 24th ID. Well, guess what? Saddam Hussein invades uh, Kuwait. I'm in the desert at NTC supporting a, 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 a general support um, artillery unit supporting um, a mechanized brigade from Fort Polk. They pull my battalion out of the uh, NTC rotation early. They don't lead the brigade there. And, and we're in Saudi Arabia in uh, late September, early October. So first Gulf War, um, um, almost invaded Haiti from the 82nd, but that was aborted. Um, I would go to Bosnia from the 25th. I would go to Afghanistan from the 25th and then uh, Iraq from First ID. And that, that, those, so those were my operational deployments. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could share with the team, you know, lessons learned and then you know, your perspective, you know, one personally, you know, as you go through and uh, those that have never been to combat, what would you offer to them? And then two, as you're walking through this, the experience of when you go to combat and the difference, you know, one is going as a staff officer or as a junior leader, but then going back as a commander and how that and how that varies. Right. So. Um, so one of the things I really kind of I, I say, you know, uh, we, we play games football games, basketball games, and we're, we're, we train and then we go to combat. And I would like to surmise that uh, there's a common, there's a common term between all of them. And, and for me, it's the word commitment. And I say commitment is without, um, without um, uh, constraints. And so when you're committed to your ball player on the team, you, you do, you, you understand what it is to give your all, regardless of consequence. And it's the same that when you train, it's the same when you go to combat. And if you can live your, with that kind of mindset, um, you know, I, I, I say particularly as an artilleryman, we, I kid their infantrymen, but we fire live rounds all the time. And there's consequence if we don't put those rounds in the same place, in the right place, in, in peace or in war. And so um, that, that's the kind of, um, you can't have this on and off switch. I don't believe you can. Um, you, you have to train the way you're going to fight. You know, it's a cliche, but there, but, um, and the, the good units, the ones that narrow that or, or that, 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 that understanding and appreciation that the way you train and the way you fight are the same thing, then, um, then, then you do well. But I, I want to share an example. I want to share a story, actually. Um, it was during the first Gulf War. I was a, I was a second lieutenant platoon leader, and, um, and I remember, you know, the scenario. So we're, you know, this is the f ground war that's moving pretty quickly, and and we're not staying anywhere long, and and we had to occupy to support um, support a, a, a maneuver element, and it was just the bad area um, of unexploded ordnance and enemy bunkers cooking off. It was just, it was not very good, and and one of the batteries had 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 requested to find an alternate location um and so that really put more pressure on the other units and and i um uh i was in a, a location which i was uncomfortable and i i asked permission of finding location and the battalion commander told us no so so i got my squad leaders together or section chiefs together and i said look um this is where we're going to dismount. I want you to walk your vehicles in. These are track vehicles, eight inch artillery pieces. Cause we, I just don't, I was not comfortable. So anyway, uh, uh, long story short is, uh, uh, gun five, six and seven got in fine. Gun eight was pulling in as they were occupying, um, a DPICM bomblet went off and it wounded, um, uh, one of my section chiefs. And, um, and I remember uh, first Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Bruce Wing True, 
and I was at the Amon Circle, and I remember just ripping over to uh, to seeing him because I saw him actually fall and hit the ground through my uh, Amon Circle, and um, and we weren't doing anything like the combat medic uh, was. A, it wasn't a medic; it was combat lifesaver. We were just everybody was just kind of kind of frozen. And I, I finally got on my knees and I started cutting, uh, cutting his pants leg open. And, and then we started the medevac process. And I just, I don't know, I just, it was kind of a blur, but I kind of had to kind of yell to get them into action. And, and so anyway, uh, Sergeant, Sergeant True got evac all the way to Long Stew. He could have, he could have lost his leg, but he didn't. And, and it all turned out okay. And, and so after the war, I, I all of a sudden I, I was, you know, we're waiting to leave and, and I pull out my bayonet and it's got blood on it. And I couldn't remember. I'm like, how did this blood? And I realized it was Sergeant True's blood. And then I started running over my head what had happened. And, and I felt it was a failure. I, I, I failed as a leader to really understand the magnitude of making sure that people were prepared to do what they were supposed to do. And I, and I swear, I made a promise that day that that would never happen again. Um, and I, 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 I failed. And, um, and so from that point on, anything that I was responsible for, I mean, I, look, we can do a million things and, and not do any of them well. Um, you know, I think as leaders, one of the things that I think you, you and you do now is sort of s sort out the, and prioritize and make sure people understand what's in more important. And, and going to combat it to me is shoot, move, and communicate. Can, can, and can we take care of ourselves? And, and I wanted to make sure that was, that was sort of my, I go, look, leaders all the way down if you got to make a choice between shoot move and communicate and can't that that's those are always going to be priority let me know what what's falling off and 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 these broad shoulders will, will, will handle it and um and so um you know that that's why to me that's so profound is that young man saved my life i mean I could have never imagined that those priorities would ultimately uh, be ones that would save my life. And, and um, you know, we, we were really blessed. I mean, you, um, you, you, I know you can recall the situation in Iraq in early 07. You know, uh, my brigade was there for 15 months, or my battalion was one of six, and, and we were the only battalion that brought everybody back alive out of the six that made up our brigade. And um, so you, you know, your belief, your standards, and I, I'm going to share one other thing. And, and this really, this really was a thread throughout my entire uh, career. I got it from Coach Young as a football player. He goes, he said, there's no such thing as a freshman mistake. Um, he says, if I put you on the field, I, I expect you to perform. And you know what, I, I, I actually would say, you know what, nobody gets to make a mistake. A standard is a standard, whether you are private or whether you're the colonel. We, we don't ask privates to do sergeant's things, not in general, but a private can't afford to make a mistake with, with the things he's supposed to do. And, and what that did was, as a leader, that's what our expectation was. If you expect low, you get low. If you expect and demand high and you take care of your people, then you get, that's what you get. So I know it was a long-winded story there, but I, I just wanted to, to really, um, you know, we, we have to learn from our mistakes and, and hopefully they don't cost, uh, you know, they don't cost too much. Sir, I, I appreciate you sharing that. So, you know, one, the open, open and honesty, um, 
and, and just to hear a leader to share some of the shortcomings in their past and then learn from them. So, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning, it goes back to this mindset. So we talked about, you know, what your parents had kind of instilled in you. We talked about this, you know, you're going to hear this underlying piece about kind of coming back to football. That's the same thing you're talking about with Coach Young, right? He's talking about, hey, you're going to plan, prepare, and execute the same way you are, and, and it doesn't matter about this, this freshman mistake. So when you mentioned, you know, you have to train as you fight, you know, and they're the same thing I've also heard – other senior leaders say you're going to fight the way you train. So that, that cliche comes back and forth in you. What I, what I offer to my son all the time is that there's only, there's only two reasons you fail or you fall short. One is you didn't study, you know, the right material or, or prepare with the right material. Or number two is you didn't prepare under harder conditions than what you were going to be evaluated or tested. And so I, I think it's very important because, sir, even – at, at, at your time as a very young second lieutenant, you're recognizing, you know, what the entire army has continued to try to carry on. This whole shoot, move, communicate, it's resonated. And, you know, my experience in the Ranger Regiment has also said, hey, we go to the big four. We're going to talk about the big five. And even till today, you know, senior leaders are reemphasizing the focus. And even here in, in a striker brigade, I tell guys, don't fear that machine. Fear the 108 squads that are going to come out the back. And so this is the reason, you know, just as you mentioned, you know, one, what are the things that are important? As my boss would say, right, shoot, move, communicate, medicate, compete, and win. So if there's no other, if you have, you know, there's no space on the calendar, I don't know what we're doing, you're going to do hard PT. You're going to be a master of your craft and know the competencies that are going to be required under the conditions that you need to deliver it under the crucible of ground combat. You know, you need to understand the medicated piece of this and you need to know your soldiers because, sir, just as you've mentioned in the very beginning example, your, your life was entrusted in the hands of a, of a young and, and enlisted uh, soldier who had just learned a skill set that he had to apply, you know, in the crucible of ground combat. And so for the team that's listening they should hear, you know, for, for a second lieutenant field artilleryman to experience this. Now, if you came out and you saw us, sir, out here in, in Lancer land, which you would see every month, you would see squad competitions. And you know what they're testing? They're testing land nav. They're testing medical skills. They're testing common, you know, uh, common skills that are expected of all soldiers that you had mentioned. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a soldier, you know, uh, all the way to those that are, are commanding at the highest levels. There's going to be privation. And you can see every time that we do this iteration, this competition, and it's about this mastery. It's not just that we did the skills. It's do you have the proficiency to apply it when you need it under those conditions? Absolutely. It is, uh, it is, it is, it is it's ultimately very simple, but it's a matter of, of, of I say, kind of building that character you can go through the motions, and guess what? In combat, you're going to go through the motions. You're 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 not going to um, you're not going to have that muscle memory. You're not going to have the confidence uh, um, to be able to to react, um, you know, on demand. It's 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 and 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 that is why I think we we. Um, I mean, that's the crux of why we're a professional force and why we are as good as we are. Um, you know, um, you know, I have to thank my non-commissioned officers. I mean, um, I, I used to, I, I, I used to tell my leaders, I said, look, you, you, you like me as a leader. You, you like the leader. You like what's coming out. It's because of my non-commissioned officers. They raised, they raised me right. And, and um, you know that's that's uh, that's what this 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 is all about, sir. You're you're speaking my love language, so I, I want everybody that's going to be listening to this know that we hadn't had a conversation before this. But I've told this many a times. You know, I, I am the product of non commissioned officer investment and development since the time that I was a young officer, and I've talked about my very first platoon star in the army all the way up to the point where, you know, I thought I was going to leave Ranger School and there was an NCO that stopped and said, no, 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 no. You know, he sat me down, gave me a candy bar, and, I, and he was like, you're going to go back. And, you know, he gave me the talk I needed in that 10 minutes to get back and finish Ranger School. And it wasn't until after I graduated that I found out and I found that NCO. He wasn't even Ranger qualified, sir. 
and he wasn't even 11 Bravo. He was a 92 Yankee that had been working in there and stationed there, but he was a non-commissioned officer that at that at that moment in that time, Second Lieutenant Chung, you know, needed some investment and in, uh, you know that little love that you don't necessarily want. Yeah, right. That in, in your development, yes, sir. So you know, and and I appreciate you sharing you know this this aspect of this because it is important. You know, if we go back to the foundation and the core of what is important and build the reps of this, because you know, as you mentioned, to get after the proficiency that what we're expecting of our team, then there's only one way to build a rep. You have to do it the exact same way every time. Otherwise, we're really not building proficiency, and you're not going to know how your your team's going to perform when you end up having to make that decision um, and, and you end up going, uh, going forward. But, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of setting the stage for this, and you, you've talked about, you know, some of these highlights and these experiences walking into combat. And now, you know, you've also mentioned as a leader the responsibility of your soldiers and even bringing them all back and their families and the investment in that. So, you know, one, if you focus on the core, you know, and the things that are important, as you mentioned, kind of these key priorities, and at the same time you're taking care of your soldiers, that's probably a pretty good approach as you, are, are, as you find yourself being a leader and having to take them to the uh, crucible of ground combat. But I was wondering now if, you know, we kind of get to this point, and I, I know our, our team is going to know a little bit about your story and, and then the fact that you're a, a double amputee. But I was wondering if you could walk us through, I know you've highlighted a little bit about in the beginning, but everything that kind of led up to the beginnings in the, in the situation that started in, uh, in May of 2007. Right. So, um, so the night I was wounded, it was actually um, – I was actually, uh, I had just attended a memorial service for, uh, for two soldiers in a, in a sister battalion for my brigade. Um, um, First Lieutenant Ryan Jones and his driver, uh, Specialist Sunson, who had been killed like four days before, four days earlier. Um, for some reason, and again, um, I guess we had kind of known death, but sometimes especially when you're probably attending a memorial service, it, you have time to really kind of sink in. So I, I was really kind of struggling with the with it. I didn't know these young men in particular, but they were from Fort Riley. And so, you know, I, I say that's sort of, you know, that's sort of the back, that's sort of where my heart and my mind are, you know, as I'm, that was the last thing that I went to that day was uh, I was heading back to my headquarters, back to Liberty. I was leaving Falcon. Off of Route Jackson, and and bam, I get hit, and um, I mean this thing blows me out of my vehicle. I I mean I can remember kind of flying through the air and hitting the ground and rolling a few times before I came to a stop on my back, and and I knew um, I I knew it was serious. I knew I was hurt. I I couldn't move, and uh, I said, God, I don't want to die here, and that was it. Um. Um, I was in, I was vehicle three or four. So my vehicle eventually stops and, 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 um, I was fortunate that my, my acting command Sergeant major, uh, first Sergeant Frederick Johnson was in the vehicle behind mine. So he was the first to arrive at my vehicle when it finally came to a stop. And he was the one to recognize I was missing. He found me roughly a hundred meters from where my vehicle stopped. I was already unconscious. He started to resuscitate me, and that's where Private Brown um, put the uh, tourniquets on my legs. I remember them. So I was conscious. I remember them trying to get me in a vehicle. I was so wet and slippery with blood. They had to pull off a lot of my clothes so they could just pick me up because I kept slipping out of my hands. I remember once they kind of got me in the vehicle, seeing basically my foot in my lap, and I started to, uh, th so then, I, and I, I hadn't felt my legs, but I knew something was wrong. I, you know, I probably started to, uh, at least, I, if not going to shock or whatever, but I was like, I can't feel my legs. And they were trying to keep me calm. Um, got me in the vehicle. I remember, you know, kind of rolling back to Falcon. We were lucky that we were pretty close to Falcon, so they got me in and as they got me into the TMC, I guess they had 
made some, they knew I was hurt. So my brigade commander was in there. And, and one of my battalion com, fellow battalion commanders and his sergeant major who ran the, uh, ran the hospital, ran the BSB, I remember seeing them as they were wheeling me in or bringing me in. And, and the look on their face told me everything. So I knew I was, um, I knew I was in bad shape. And I, I really didn't think I was going to, uh, I wasn't sure I was going to make it back. And, um, and so the last thing I remember hearing in Iraq was hearing the helicopter coming in to get me. And then uh, that's it until I uh, eventually wake up at Walter Reed. Um, one of my classmates and teammates from West Point who had been, who had heard I got wounded, and he was actually stationed in Canada, got permission to take leave, and, and he would actually help take me off the, um, take me off the, the medevac that got to Walter Reed. And um, he was in the ICU when, um, I mean, he was there for a few days, and he would be the first person to actually hear me speak when I came out of my coma. Um, uh, a week after being there, uh, the blood vessels in my left leg could no longer sustain blood flow, and I started to bleed to death in the ICU. Nurse literally pulled pull off her belt, put a tourniquet around my left leg. They took me into surgery and amputated my, my left leg above the knee to save my life. The next day, the same thing happened in my right leg, but, they, but the docs pulled a vein from my left bicep and uh, saved my right leg. Um, by this point, I was out of my coma, and um, I, was, I was getting beat to death going in and out of surgery. So I, I, made, I made the decision for them to take my right leg. I just wanted to be done with this and move on. When I, so a week later, they amputated my right leg above the knee. Um, when I came out of surgery, they gave me some more great news. Uh, they found out that my, uh, my right elbow and my right arm were broken and would need surgery to repair those. Um, I came out, so I had that surgery a week later and, and I um, uh, sustained ulnar nerve damage, which still prevents me from using all the fingers on my right hand and the radial nerve damage prevented me from picking up my right wrist. And then I couldn't, uh, because my body was producing too much calcium, I couldn't bend my arm anymore. So I was functioning down to one limb. I was 210 pounds before I got wounded. I was now down to 148. And, uh, and I only had one limb I could use. My non-dominant left arm and hand was all I could use. So I was, dude, I was just, um, I, I was broken. And, and you know, and I don't say what's funny, but, you know, I, I, I say every day we find out who we are. Um, well, I wanted to quit. And I remember just saying, fuck it. I just, I didn't want to live like this. I didn't want to, I, I mean, how do you imagine your life like this? And, and, and so in my mind, I tried to quit, but in my mind, I wasn't a quitter. I never quit before in my life. And, and as bad as things were, I just couldn't quit now. And I said, you know what? I said, you know, screw it. You know what? I got nothing else to lose. I'm just going to make the most of every day. And so I just, that was sort of that, that was sort of my line in the sand when I was just like, my God, I just can't even quit. What else are you going to do to me? And so I just started fighting back. And so um, I found out I still had the heart of a soldier. I still wanted to serve. I said, look, I was a light colonel. They weren't paying me for how fast I could run anyway. So I'm like, hey, I want to keep serving. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, and so another, another almost eight years later, I would, before I finally retired, the Army promoted me and uh, gave me a chance to command again. And so um, none of those things uh, I could ever imagine, Colonel, but it's – and, 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 and really my whole life, I could have never imagined. Um, but it's, it's about the effort. It's about grinding. It's about just working hard and, and, um, 
you know, my life has certainly uh, given me more than I could have ever imagined. And, uh, and so the, the thread or the secret is just, just working hard and, and, you know, trying to do the right thing and, you know, and, you know, stay humble. Um, is uh, kind of my take. Yeah. You know, sir, I, it, it, it's a, that's an incredible story and, and to go through anything like that. And I know you've met so many other soldiers that have had similar experiences and have gone through these roller coasters of emotions. And, and I know it's going to resonate with our team as they're listening to this, as you share that just from the, the, you know, going through this, um, you know, emotional portion as a battalion commander and, and, and attending a memorial ceremony. And then as this goes back and then you're finding yourself and, you know, there's flashes of what's currently happening. And as you walk through this entire piece, and and then I think I read a story about, you know, your classmates. So I go back to this same, same thread again about how football is family and Chuck Shretzman, I think was the individual you were talking about. And so could you share with the team, like how important and what was that relationship that you had with, with, uh, with Chuck? Well, Chuck, and so so I'm going to come back. I want to focus on this word commitment, and that's why I say it's sort of blind. Your team, you know, your team, just because your team lives forever. You know, you may not be playing together. You may not be on the same field or same location, but but the bonds that you form because you c- committed to one another never never dissipate we were each other's best men in their weddings and and um you know he was there for when i got wounded and and uh and unfortunately for i mean he is going through a battle now fighting a lou garrick's disease or als and and it's you know our journey continues um another teammate uh one that uh, a lot people don't realize that he was with the asymmetric warfare group, Will Huff, class of 91. He actually, when he found out, we actually, two nights before I got wounded, his, his organization was with my battalion. And we spent a night in our JSS in, uh, in Baghdad. Um, he, the night I was wounded, he found out I was wounded. He somehow uh, you, you guys got your soft connections. He's a Ranger Regiment guy and a uh, CAG guy as well. But he gets a helicopter to to the cache, and he would he would fly with me all the way from Baghdad to Germany. That was as far as they let him go. He stayed with me the whole time. And uh, yeah, that's a probably not a, a that's a, not an atypical situation, but. Um, that is that is brotherhood and 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 um you know private brown eric brown he's out of the army i i I promoted him to sergeant i went to his wedding i went to his graduation his college graduation and and so we're connected for life and um yeah you know i um it, it it's all kind of, I think, character. You, um, this commitment that you make, body, mind, and spirit, soul to each other, it it doesn't dis- it doesn't dissipate. It doesn't live. It doesn't go away because you're you're not there. You you know, it's it's the bond. You and I know this bond that that started for us at West Point. Um, it, 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 the, 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 the commitment to that experience and that shared sacrifice is what, is what lives, is what, is what makes soldiering a passion. It, it works, makes being a soldier for life, so, uh, being a soldier for life. And um, I think that's so well said, sir. And I mean, for those those that didn't have your experience of playing, you know, on a football team, but are just in a squad, 
and the things they're going together, they're going the uh, going through together in any you know admits adversity. And I know that's one of your things, overcoming adversity. And we've talked about you know this journey together. So it's about building this network and those that are with you going through this. And you just talked about you know these great teammates that have come to you absolutely in your, in your moment of need. But it wouldn't even have taken a crucible moment. They would have been there, just as you mentioned, right, to be standing next to you in your in your wedding, just to share in, in one of those experiences, both that's incredibly one of the you know, most positive or most memorable things that you're going to go through. But, you know, the other thing about your story, sir, that's so impressive and, and you know, you, you have been so heartfelt and open, the fact that. You know, you go through this and everybody sees this as like, then this is like a superhero. You know, he's he gets to this one point, he's going through this crucible moment and uh, and and nobody wants to share, the, you know, the, the honesty that says it gets us to the point where I just don't want to do this anymore. But you don't realize, you know, what, what your parents have ingrained in you and the work ethic and the and network that you have surrounded that says, no, you're not going to quit. You know, and as Ryan Holiday, who we've, we've talked with before, talks about the obstacle is the way. And, you know, and, and, and I go back to what you were sharing the stories about, you know, what your parents, you know, had taught you and what the things they did, you know, and their experiences and share with you. And, and it's like, let's go, we're going to, we're going to get after this. And the most impressive portion out of this is I I remember reading an article about you and you were like, they're not going to retire me. I'm going to choose the moment on my terms and my condition to end my service. And so for anybody that's going to be listening to this, and, and as I'm hearing you and this love for your soldiers, you know, and for those that y'all serve with, I guarantee you, sir, if you look back at this and, and you would you would echo and say, hey, one of the reasons why, you know, yeah, there was a stubbornness not to quit, but part of it is to get back with those that you want to serve with. Would you say that's a, was that, is that the case, sir? Absolutely. Um, you know, um, you, you know that, the, the, you know, in fact, the, this, the, the progress that you've made up, it's, it, it is, um, and you'll, eventually one day you'll, you'll retire, but um, it, it, to me, it's just sort of like, I, I, I mean, it's, um, when I was a battalion commander, I was like, this is not about me, it's about it's about the perpetuation of our army. I had one goal, and my goal was was this simple. It was, I, I want my soldiers to experience the best they can be so that they can make the best decision about whether or not they want to continue to serve. And so it's my responsibility to, my responsibility uh, with everyone to create an environment that is forgiving, that doesn't have an agenda, so that everybody can be the best they can be. You know, I, I just it's kind of a just a real kind of a weird sidebar, but you know, I had a soldier that I had to ch- I had to chapter out. Um, he just you know we did everything we could, but. A handful of years after uh, he had been out, his mother contacted me, and she actually thanked me for the way we treated him and the things that we talked to him about. You know, we didn't throw him out and say, you're a dirt bag or anything. I mean, that's what I mean, dignity and respect. I mean, it's unfortunate this young man didn't work out. But, you know, I was like, I was really you know, probably unfairly hard on on making sure we were doing the right thing. I said, look, this this person decided to serve our country. We can't take that lightly. And I and and this is not about the desirables or the undesirables. This is about making sure that we've done the right things to make sure that this person can be all they can be. And and um and um that that, that that's how much I value that a, a person that or, or, or people. Sir, I mean, you're, you're echoing with our senior leaders and we communicate and nest all the way down. I mean, the senior leadership today is talking about people first. And really, as you're describing it, it's, it's what I would offer. It's called being a steward of the profession. 
and walk in this journey. And, and as a responsible, you know, responsibility about it being a steward of the profession, you have to create, as you mentioned, this environment, but you have to build this trust within the organization and this fiduciary responsibility of building trust with the American people because those that choose to serve are America's treasures. And, and as my boss has mentioned several times, you know, sometimes when our soldiers, you know, end up departing, it's, it's either one of two reasons, a failure to lead or a failure to repair. You know, and, and as we go back through this portion of this, you know, I, I can echo a, a very similar story. You know, when I was a company commander in Alaska under Charlie Glenn, um, I, I gave a, a soldier an Article 15. And, and I had given several soldiers, you know, UCMJ. And then later on as a battalion commander, I got a phone call. And the soldier calls me and he goes, hey, sir, he goes, this is Justin Neal. And I, and I used to serve with you in, in Alaska in, in Bravo Company 501st. I said, okay. I said, how are you doing? Uh, what can I help you with? He goes, uh, y- you may not remember me, but you gave me an Article 15, and you had my dad on the phone. And I said, hang on. Were you in Sergeant First Class and Iberger's platoon? And he goes, yes, sir, I know exactly who you are. And I went back to this, you know, this, this plaque that they had given me and his name signed on there. And what he shared with me was, hey, sir, that moment right there completely changed my life. He goes, and, and I know we only had like a 20-minute interaction. He goes, but I've been following you over these years. And he was reaching out to me at that time, sir, because he was looking for a letter of recommendation to become an officer to, to join the, the New York National Guard. Wow. And, and now he's, you know, doing some great stuff and all these things. But one of the things that just, I mean, absolutely, you know, I, I, I just treasure is – he will. He has now been in contact with me since the time I was in battalion command, and we had this phone call probably about once every six weeks. He'll send me a text. He'll thank me for something. He'll share. And, and the thing that I was most impressed upon is here is this soldier that I gave an Article 15 to, and then he was sharing with me that he was getting ready to have the birth of his first child. And now he's sending me pictures of his son, and he's talking about how he wants to you know, grow up in these. And, and I said, that right here, I was telling my son, this is what the Army is all about. This is what this thing, the profession of arms are. This is an experience, just even in this small interaction that I had with this soldier, you know, it has grown into now this relationship Sir, just as you mentioned with your medic, not only just saving your life, but even now to the relationship you have today. Yeah, that's a great story, Jonathan. That I, I uh, um, that it just, yeah, those are, I mean, that that's priceless, and and um, you know, those are the kind of you know you you think about those kind of things. Those are the things that you you'll carry with you forever. It's not the uh, it's not the the jump or it's just a van or this or that. It's just it's those stories that uh, that really matter. Sir, that that that's exactly right. And I think that you know, as you're making your way back, one of the things that's also impressive is that you are willing to share this story and share it relatively, you know, soon after your your event. And so I was wondering if you could share with the team, you know, how you made your way. To, to, even though you're you're saying you're from the Chesapeake area, you probably offended all these Redskins fans and ended up getting tied up to the Giants and in the in the the magical 2007 season that I know Tom Brady doesn't want to ever remember. Right. So um, again, it's it's all about uh, I say it's all about teammates and um, and so one of my uh, one of my classmates and football teammates, Mike Sullivan was a coach for the New York Giants. And he came to and he came down to visit me um, in his small window of free time he had in the summer um, at Walter Reed. And uh, at the 07, 08 season, ironically started out 0-2 for the Giants, and they were coming to Washington to play the 2-0 Redskins. So Mike uh, called me up and and uh, so he called me on a Monday and said, hey, do you want to come to the game? I said, sure. And he asked me, you know, I told him four tickets. And so then he called me back on Tuesday. He says, hey, you think you'd be willing to t- talk to the team? I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna like, sure, why not? Now, listen, I've never spoken uh, public speaking or spoken any, at least any organization outside of the Army. 
But I said, yeah, he asked me to do it. And I said, yeah, I'd do it. And so long story short is um, I speak to him the night before the game and, and, they, and, and, and they were going to put me in the stands, but they, just, they asked me to stay on the sideline. So I stayed on the sideline and we were going in the locker room at halftime. It was Redskins 14, Giants 3. And I'm like, boy, you're a heck of a motivational speaker. So, but anyway, long story short, the Giants would rally. They won the game uh, 24 to 17. And that was the first of 11 road games, 11 road games that they would win, culminating um, in Super Bowl 42 when they beat the 18 and old Patriots in Super Bowl 42. And I also gave the speech the night before that game. And the, 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 the thing I want to share with you, particularly about the night before the game, before the Super Bowl, was I remember telling them, I said, look, if I could be anywhere in the world right now, it would be back with my soldiers in Iraq. And I, I mean, I got emotional and I said, but I mean, I know that's not possible. Um, but I also said, look, I, I watched you guys become a team. And I said, if I, if I could go to Iraq, I'd take every single one of you with me. Um, I said, we're going to win the game tomorrow. And that was, you know, that kind of the way I closed my speech. And, so, long story short, we won Super Bowl, beat the undefeated Patriots, and 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 I and so I got a Super Bowl. I actually had two Super Bowl rings, or both uh, Super Bowls against them. But again, you can't make this up. I mean, <laughs> you know, that that's amazing story, sir. I mean, and, and I read that you actually. Uh befriended you know coach Coughlin as he was going through and you were having these conversations and he'd ask you to go through this portion of it and recognized and it is 2007 for them was was a, a pretty magical season in in defeating you know a team that arguably at that time was going to be one of the greatest in history and in, in dethrone the Dolphins you know back in 72 and uh until until that miraculous catch you know that they then are repeating later on you know when they played the the Patriots again but you know, it, it's also it, it's also interesting that you're not just giving this back to the same thing. You know, I, I saw that you also built a relationship with Coach Harbaugh, and uh, when he got rec recognized for the Salute to Service Award, and you met him in General Odierno's house, and I was wondering if you could share that story. Well, um, yeah. So uh, I think Coach Coughlin, uh, John, uh, John, Coach Harbaugh, the Baltimore Ravens uh, coach, and there were, I mean, there were folks from the NBA, and and it was just an honor that uh, General Odenero, who's the chief of staff at the time, um, allowed me to kind of be there as as our Army recognized um, uh, folks in the sports world that were um, that were giving back to our, our service members, in, in particular the Army. Um, uh, and so last year, you know, I had exchanged some very sporadic uh, texts with uh, with Coach Harbaugh. In fact, I'd actually met his brother, our paths across Jim Harbaugh, across a few more times. But uh, last year, uh, Coach Harbaugh um, asked me to come to training, the Ravens training camp. And, um, and uh, again, just the kind of, maybe impart some some uh some messages and some wisdom uh with their team and and uh they had a pretty you know pretty successful year as well i mean yeah so that just i'm just a, a commonality between the inevitable i guess <laughs> but um it's um it, it, it's uh it, it's really special uh, uh i i say uh to lead, to be able to lead, inspire. Um, it's um, maybe natural or just fun. I mean, I, I, look, I, I, Jonathan, I, I'll, I'll say I'm at a point in my life where I, I say, look, I, I, there's no more mountains for me to climb. There's no more dragons for me to slay. It's really about giving back. And, um, you know, I've, I've been blessed to have a, a, a platform um, a, a notoriety or wherever where um, people want 
me to share and and I guess I'm I'm glad to share I'm in and uh I it's trust me it's like I'm getting paid to be able to give back especially to to you and your and your team um because that's that's what uh that's what and that's what my service is all about you know this is my second service and and every one of us will in some ways have a second service um uh, after we take the uniform off, sir, I'm I'm hearing a couple of things here. So you know, a lot of a lot of guests we've had in the past. You know, Mike Barwa's strength coach. You know, and he talked about helping the Mueller brothers. You know, uh, Brock, who ended up having to recover and walk after a a pretty traumatic uh, uh, vehicle accident. You know, what you talk about. You know, uh, about it's not about the number of dragons and, and accomplishments. It's about the journey and these relationships and giving back. It sounds very similar to the message that Ray Dalio had mentioned as well. And then, and you know, when I, I always kind of live by this thing, it's twice in rows of streak, third time's a habit. So I don't think it's 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 you know coincidental that you spoke to the 2007 Giants. They go on a Super Bowl run. Then you're speaking to the Ravens. Lamar Jackson's like up for Offensive Player of the Year. They have this unbelievable season. We need to take that same thing. And as a Cowboys fan, we 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 are having some trouble right now, and we need to turn around and capitalize on these three wins. But before we do that. We were, you know, since we're up here in JBLM, we got to help the home team with uh, with Russell Wilson. Maybe get you up here and, and talk to these guys as well. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's really cool. I, I mean, I've look, I've worked with. Um, I was with uh, the University of Texas when they came out on the short end of the national championship against Alabama. I worked with them that year. Again, uh, one of my uh, classmates and teammates. His brother was the defensive coordinator with Texas. So I, so I got, I've worked with Ohio State, Arizona, Oklahoma, uh, of course, the Black Knights. And so it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's really good to see, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, sometimes we focus so much on winning. Um, um, I just, I, I uh, maybe um, I'll save this, but it's really just about, you know, I, I say being your best. You know, if you can, if you can be your best, if you can be present, if you can be present, be your best, and you can be at peace. You can, you can be comfortable in life knowing that you put it all on the table. That's all we can, that's all you can ever ask for. Doesn't mean you're going to win everything, but if you, if you, if you did your best, you competed, as you say, competed, you prepared and you put it on the line, you know, the, you know, the other guys on scholarship too, he get, he's getting paid too. And so you're not going to win everything in life, but you can be at peace with that. Yeah, no, sir. That's a, that's, that's great advice. And, and, and for our team that's listening, you know, it goes back to that same aspect. You may not win everything, but it's that journey and the relationships, the network that you build. And, and I'm still starting to also see that trend, though. So, you know, as it begins the next season, maybe I need to start looking at where is old uh, Greg Gatson been speaking and what college and pro teams he's talking to, because those are the ones to watch that probably have a good year as they're going through. But, you know, sir, as before we kind of, you know, move toward the, the end of this, and I really want to talk about the diversity pop portion of it. I think it's a great way to book in the, the end of this, you know, this conversation we have. And I do got to ask, you know, so, you know, for the team, you know, you, you have this unfortunate accident um, that, that's going on or unfortunate incident in combat that happens. You're going through this journey. You, you have some remarkable, you know, relationships and experiences after that. And one of them includes being a movie star. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, um, that's in, in large part, or uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, part of this New York giant story because the director, Peter Berg also did, Lone Survivor, I'm sure uh, a lot of people have seen. Um, he also did The Kingdom, a um, couple of uh, good movies. But he's a New Yorker, and he's a New York Giants fan. And he was just kind of aware of my my story and my connection with the New York Giants. And and he, um, he would see a photo, he said. He saw a photo of me in a National Geographic because I was, uh, test, I was test piling some 
bionic prosthetics, and that's where he got the answer, the idea of uh, asking to cast me in a movie. And and so uh, he calls me up. I was in the work. I was actually doing my War College Fellowship when he called me. I'm like, you want to be? We want you to be in my movie. And I'm like, sure, why not? I mean, I got this new kind of. Not new, but I'm just taking on anything that comes up. And, and you know, it's funny. I said I would do it, but and then kind of afterward, I'm like, hey, I'm never going to be in a movie. And so he kept trying to get me out to L.A. to do a screen test, and I wouldn't go. So he flies to D.C., and I did my screen test. In all places, Dan Snyder's office, the owner of the Washington Redskins. So, and, uh, and so he said, yeah, you'll work. And so... You know, a few months later, I'm in, I'm in Hawaii filming. That's great, sir. Yeah, and I know that uh, you've been interviewed and you credit, you know, Peter Berg and, and some of the other actors that helped work with you, but it's, it's impressive to see that you just went through another challenge. You know, and you're throwing yourself out there and it's the confidence. That's really the thing that, that I want people to, to realize. You know, at the end of this, this traumatic and this crucible moment, you know, and you get to that point where you'd mentioned, you know, you kind of the lowest of lows, and then you have to really determine what you're all about. And as you mentioned, you know, you, you talked about how you were raised and you're, you're a grinder. And part of that thing is, hey, I'm going to go find, you know, what I'm good at in, in, in other areas. And, that, and I, that's what I was pretty impressed about. But more importantly was I'm going to be able to do this and I'm going to retire on my own terms. And you get selected again for command, you know, command at Belvoir and all those and that's it's impressive to see. And, and, and for those that are, you know, we mentioned in, in previous discussions about grit and resiliency, you're, you're a living example of that and the fact that you're still wanting to give back to those that are having some of their own challenges that they can share and take some of the things that they learned from just hearing your story today. Thank you, John. Hey, sir, so, you know, I, I think it's great when you opened up and you kind of, you know, laid out your mantra and saying, hey, this is what I think about establishing a winning culture, about pride, poise, and team, and the importance of this. We've got a little bit about your background. You've told us our story, kind of going through this piece of it. And it's always got this, you know, resonating thing about football. And and, and as I was doing some research, I, I found out that you were the, the co-founder of this, of this organization called Diversity Pop. And so I started to do some research, and it's, it's incredible right now because, you know, the Army's – looking at how do we get after these three corrosives and you know one of them is 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 racism and part of that stuff it goes back as you know you have this unconscious bias and you know all these things and and uh we're, we're actually dedicating time every month where we actually discuss and have some of these hard conversations you know open up the mind to be critical thinkers you know get away from some of those things to have some of these difficult conversations but as i saw and i just looked at the 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 impressive group of individuals that formed this. I was wondering if you could share with the team how you came upon this portion of the journey, kind of talk a little bit about the group that's in there and some of the goals and what's kind of the intent and guiding principles for this organization. Well, look, uh, I, I appreciate that question and, and really, um, uh, really your, your empathy as you kind of talk about um, – you know, talk about the challenges that we face as a country. I mean, we're, we are always citizens. And, and so as, as, as you think about the context of, of, of our team and, and the diversity of our team, it's funny that, um, that uh, you know, we, we don't give second thought about, um, um, you know, our, our, our teammates. We shouldn't. And you know, that's what we aspire to. Um, but, you know, um, we, we live in a society where, where people are, are marginalized. They're not treated equally. And, and so and, um, in light of the things that, you know, happened this summer, probably, you know, uh, po po uh, polarizing around George Floyd's, um, uh, you know, being killed by the police and and the other things that sort of the, sort of bought, shined a light on this on this part of our society it shows that we have some challenges you know i was I, my parents were living in dc in the 60s and i was born in 66 so i'm here but i don't have any memories of that i don't want to say that i do but it it sort of made me reflect 
it made me reflect, first of all, to say, look, 54 years ago, these same kind of things were happening in society, and, and, and here we are, you know, again, it, they're happening. And, and it saddened me. It actually, um, um, it, it, it saddened me, it depressed me a little bit. And so my classmate, Drew Barkwitz, um, who is uh, in the, he's, he's part of this, um, um, has a suite of apps under this umbrella called Patriot Apps, thought, talked to, started talking to me about uh, diversity pop. And so it was just he and I. And, um, and I said, you know, Drew, first of all, I thanked him because I, you know, I'm sitting here feeling like I'm on the sidelines. What am I going to do? I can sit here and, and, and complain about these inequities, but what am I doing to make a difference? And this, and I felt like being a part of this, this, uh, this diversity pop was my chance to make a difference. And so 12 of us, mostly the core of us, probably 10 of us or 12 are, are actually prep school classmates from the prep school class of 85. So not only the West Pointer, but, uh, but a subset of West Pointers. And we have a couple of Navy, uh, I think we have one Naval Academy grad and one Air Force Academy grad or one somebody from the Air Force. So, so the core of us are, we're all military. The, the co-founders are all military. And, and really, this is about understanding that um, we, we look at diversity. My, my premise or our premise is diversity does not equal inclusion. You got to, you, you have a, you have a, a diverse team. You inherit that. You didn't pick anybody on that diverse team. But as the leader of it, it's your responsibility to make it inclusive because that's how you become a team, um, at least a strong team. A team of teams is really an inclusive team. And, uh, and, and so that's the experience that I want this app to kind of help people inventory themselves and develop a self-awareness for their weaknesses, for their blind spots. We look, we all have them. And, and, and so the question is, well, you sit here and say, we don't have any biases. We all have biases. The, the question is, are you aware of them? And, then, and do they disadvantage someone? Do you treat somebody? Do you, do you act out on those biases, either consciously or subconsciously? And that's where we want to get to a place where we are always aware of them and we don't, we don't let them interfere with being fair and just. And so that's what this, that, that's the energy that I'm, I'm putting behind. And I'm, I'm super impressed, Jonathan, that you, you were aware of that. And, and uh, you guys, look, we, we can just, we can, we can get it to you. I, I we'd love your feedback. It's, it would be a, a great thing. Um, and, and, we can talk more about that later, but, but, um, yeah, yes, sir. Absolutely. I, I'll tell you when I was doing some research on it, you know, I was impressed because this is one of those things that we're trying to gather our own diversity pop leadership group together, you know, within our, yeah, we're picking these things up every 11 seconds or something. We always got, and so look, everybody's got their phone in their hand. So why not connect with something? Why not have something that connects and take, uh, takes advantage of that connectivity that you have. That, that's exactly right, sir. And so as I was looking at it, and, and so so as the team understands kind of what we're going through, you know, you already kind of give the background of, of these individuals that have come together and said, hey, let, let's find a way to address this. I, I think it's great as you talk about increased self-awareness. How, how do we take this and then apply this to our own approach so we can see the biases that we have and recognize the blind spots that we do have? But, you know, some of your, your principles that you guys have laid out this, let's scale diversity for everybody, leaders lead everybody, blind spots, limit our fun, 
culture awareness is contagious. We can condition diversity and diversity is our destiny. Like these are all discussions that we're trying to have, but it's how do you prime the audience? How do you get them to increase their own awareness and then have the right individuals that can have the critical, you know, thinking discussion and be able to see it and apply it in the right situations. And so absolutely, sir, we would look, we would look forward, you know, as you guys continue to onboard this portion of this you know, and, and to look for opportunities to provide you feedback. Because right now we are setting that in to have some what we call tough conversations, you know, about a lot of things. And and part of it is is the leader a lot of times, you know, as I'm finding out with my own son who's who's constantly chewing on my ear about these things is I have to find myself in listening mode. And, and to hear a perspective that he's getting from somebody else and how he retrieves this information and, and what, you know, platforms is he talking to. Because if he's coming to me to have this conversation and I turn him away, then I'm already establishing my own, you know, perspective on, on what he's going to think how I see the problem. Right, right. And, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, unfortunately, um, I, I would think um, so. As a leader, I think w- one of our one of our greatest characteristics, especially as we co- become um, more senior, is the is our humility, and that humility uh, essentially should kind of translates to, in some ways, your empathy, your ability to be empathetic. Um, I mean, we can stand on top of a rock and be the standard bearer, you know, of perfection. Um, or we can remember the mistakes that we made and, and, and you know, and, and, and foster in a, uh, an environment where people can make mistakes, where they can grow and, and become strong. And, you know, through your extension of trust, empowerment and holding, and holding folks accountable. Um, and so there's there's always a fine balance. Obviously, there's some things that are that are not negotiable. But um, and you know, I say that's typically your integrity, and uh, you know, those are you know, you don't have you don't you, you don't always recover second chances there. But but again, it, 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 there's no one size fits all. You gotta you know, everybody has to evaluate that on their own their own with their own biases. But um, I I. Um, I, I don't know if you find your. I, I just found that the, the just the more I, I I actually you become more. I think you become more sympathetic and more empathetic the, the longer you do this because you just kind of you really appreciate the 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 broad breadth of of who you have and what and and their potential and. Hey, look, I, I can always say that some some cat gave me a, a chance a long time ago and 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 has given me chances. Oh yeah, I rolled a Humvee, I caught on fire, I've had you know, so look, I could <laughs> listen. Yes, sir. I, I, I'm here and so um well, sir, I, I commend uh this this organization on what they're trying to tackle and and, uh, and to set this, you know really another vehicle to to connect individuals to see themselves you know their blind spots some unconscious uh, bias to have these these tough conversations to help us you know avoid some of the polarization and, and i have to be honest with you you know when you hear comments that you know from from leaders or from any soldiers that say hey all we see is you know green i don't see it and and that's that's ignoring the problem set that that you know is truly right there that we need to have the conversation that everybody wants to have um absolutely you you yeah if you conveniently you close the door when right. you say all right it's all right yeah well okay but you know at the same time I mean, look, I'll, I'll take it. Look, I remember being in the 82nd Airborne Division, you know, being one of three black officers in the entire Devardi. I mean, it's not like, you know, you're at a social function and a hold of all the officers there in the Devardi there. Heck, it doesn't take you long to realize you're different, you know, and if you can sit there and everybody sees green, well, that, that's not the case. Yes, sir. You know, it's it's uh, it's interesting too because you know recently, I, I, maybe I just didn't 
I wasn't as aware of it, I guess is the best way to place this. And now I have a lot of younger officers, you know, that are Asian American and they're reaching out to me. And I started asking, you know, my son and, and other officers, I said, why is this the case? And, and I, and I, cause before I just didn't, didn't really, I, maybe I didn't re- recognize it or I was attuned to it. And, and a lot of them have mentioned to me, it's like, well, sir, you know, they, they see somebody like them and they're, and they're now asking the question. They want to know, you know, a little bit about your story. They want to know if you've experienced the same thing that they're experiencing now and some of the, you know, different challenges they may have went through and how you maneuver through some of those things. And so, you know, especially with my son, you know, who always wants to have this conversation, it feels like, you know, at the dinner table and especially now because, you know, they, they don't have the ability to, to have discourse and discussion at school because they're all, you know, doing stuff online. He is, he is the one always bringing some type of perspective to me that is always challenging me, you know, and, and asking myself, why do I think that way and why does he think that way? which is starting in the beginning that open of the conversation. But what I find yourself in, as you mentioned, sir, as you get older, I think, you know, you, you find yourself being a little bit more, you know, uh, hopefully you find yourself being more humble. But, you know, at the same time, you have to be more aware that you've moved closer and closer to this, these cliffs of, of, of certainty. Hey, I've done these things in my life. I know this, you know, and I don't want to do this. This is what I like. I don't like. And so when I hear something, you know, and somebody goes, hey, you know, you should do a, a podcast. I'm like, I'm not doing podcasts, you know, but then they turn around and they say, you know, this is one of their only opportunities. They're going to get a chance to hear you have a conversation with somebody else about, you know, some topics or anything that they would they may not have an, opera, uh, an opportunity. It's a different venue than just having an LPD. So I, I commend all these, this, these, uh, these efforts that you're doing, sir. And I think that, you know, today sitting down, having this conversation and, you know, you are the example of overcoming adversity, all the things we talk about grit and resiliency, you know, I appreciate and thank you for your service, you know, and I know just hearing, you know, as you describe and you talk about your soldiers, the love that you have for them, you know, I love the establishing a winning culture and the pride, poise and team mentality. And even till today, as you walk through your story, you're still finding a way to tackle something that a lot of people are trying to figure out how to get in, get into the arena on this and with this diversity pop. So, and if there's any type of feedback that you're looking for on this portion, we would we would definitely be interested, you know, to to continue yeah, that I, conversation. I'll follow you up with that. I'm I'm gonna um, we'll um, and maybe we can. Maybe we can get you guys kind of a, a local brigade version or something that um, if um, and and look, it's anonymous. So first of all, this is really cool. It's anonymous and it's it's its own, you know, itself kind of thing. But I think what we can do is we can isolate the data for you. And and I say, like, as a trainer, the training part of me is like if from an organization perspective, if there's some trends, you could focus, you could be more specific in targeting something that the data might reveal um, if, if you all use it. So, Absolutely, sir. Well, hey, sir, I, I appreciate you, you taking the time sitting down with us today. Every time we, we tell our listeners, we leave them with what are your questions, but I'd love to leave a final word with you. You'd love to leave what? The final word with you, sir. Uh, all right, got final word with me. So, um, so I, I know I've thrown a lot of, a lot of, maybe I've thrown a lot of stuff out there with you, but look, I, um, uh, I, I'm touched by this, uh, in a paraphrase, uh, the statement that Maya Angelou, uh, said, she said, people won't remember what you did. They won't remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. And so, if you kind of approach life that way and, and the people you deal with, um, um, I, I, I think you'll, you'll be all right. Um, because, uh, that's the most, imp- that's what lives. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for listening to the leadership experience. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the newest podcast. The Leadership Experience will showcase professionals within five different subseries. Number one, Masters of Our Craft, The Essence of Warfighting. Number two, Students of Our Profession, 
as we understand organizational culture and concepts of leadership. Number three, professional athletes with guns as we talk hardships and maintaining a competitive advantage. Number four, grit and resiliency, the ability to overcome and perform under pressure. And number five, safe and secure environment as we talk soldier well-being and building trust within our organization and the profession as whole. 